Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I believe we're being uh, videotaped. And uh, it's a, a great honor uh, to introduce uh, today's talk. So it's part of the, uh, if you like, popular uh, science lectures, the Nobel uh, Popular Science Lectures, uh, basically uh, jointly hosted by the School of Science and the Institute for Advanced Study. <coughs> And today's uh, talk is going to be about the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2023. And this was announced about a month ago, and to the great excitement of at least some of us in the chemistry department, uh, because there were three winners, um, Professor Monkey Bawendi of the uh, Department of Chemistry at MIT, uh, uh, Professor Bruce from uh, Columbia University, and uh, is it uh, Alexei? Uh, Ekimov, Ekimov. Uh, who was actually working in industry for a company called Nanocrystals. And <clears throat> the reason we were excited was because about six years ago, uh, Professor Jonathan Halpert joined our department uh, from the uh, Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, where he was working at the McDermott Institute. <clears throat> And that is for advanced materials and nanotechnology, which is really what we're going to be talking about today. And he originally got his PhD uh, way back in the day from MIT and the group of Mungi Bawendi. So it's a great honor that you know, this, this uh, prize was bestowed on Professor Bawendi. And I think it gives a lot of credit to Jonathan too, because uh, I think he played uh, an integral role in the development, not the discovery of the quantum dots, but the development and optimization of the synthesis. And this is a very crucial aspect that led to the eventual commercial uh, application of these uh, quantum dots in LEDs. So this is, uh, he's going to tell us today a little bit about this story, both the scientific part and I think also a little bit about the technological application. And it's partly the real-world application of this very interesting fundamental science that uh, I think John will, will relate to you. So we should always have an idea, not necessarily on the Nobel Prize, <clears throat> but <clears throat> also look for uh, interesting problems that we can work on in science that have interesting fundamental aspects, maybe challenging synthesis, because when these things were first developed, nobody knew. They, they thought, oh, yes, this would be very interesting. We can have small particles with size-dependent quantum effects, but nobody knew how to make these small particles at least as one uh, set of sizes. And so it was the work uh, of Professor Bowendi and, and uh, good students such as John that helped to develop this and make this into a reality. Anyway, enough from me. So we'll, uh, I think, have our talk until about 4 o'clock. Uh, then we'll have a Q&A. I don't know if there's anybody online can uh, ask questions, <laughs> but, but uh, you, you, you can certainly contact Jonathan in the chemistry department. Anyway, with that, sure. you, you take it away. Well, we have enough time for everyone to ask at least a couple of questions. So in anything fact, because you really you're all getting extra the credit this. here, then, yep. then you have to ask a question. So we have a rather large audience today. So I'd like to ask you guys to just keep it down, be as silent as possible <laughs> during the talk. Um, I will talk about, uh, of course, our major topic is the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2023 and the great work that the winners did, um, what their contributions were. Uh, Ian, I try to be very, very humble. Ian definitely overstates. I was a small part of a very large team uh, that worked on this uh, over many, many years. So Munji has taken students for 30, 35 years now. And I think I was number somewhere between 15 and 20 to join his group. <laughs> but uh, I'll talk about sort of what, what he did. And of course, the other winners, uh, uh, Alexei uh, Ekimov and uh, Lou Bruce. OK, so our title today is Quantum Dot, a revolutionary nanomaterial for display lighting and medical technologies. I'll talk about the applications. And also, what about this makes this kind of a good Nobel Prize topic? Why did we win a Nobel Prize for this? And why did we win it? in 2023 instead of winning it many years ago. OK, so our three winners are Munji Buendi, uh, Lou Bruce, and Alexei Ekimov. And they won this for, as the uh, committee says, the Nobel Prize awarded for the discovery and synthesis of quantum dots. And the synthesis part is actually uh, very important, not just because um, you know, the physical discovery 
is sort of the very early stages, but also because the synthesis of quantum dots, as there are a couple of my students in the audience know, is the hard part, right? <laughs> Learning you know, about the physics takes a couple of minutes, and you guys will learn about it in a moment. Um, synthesizing particles that can actually achieve what the physics suggests they can achieve has taken us 30, maybe 40 years. It's a very difficult um, chemical problem. So uh, each of these uh, gentlemen has a, a sort of a unique um, contribution to this prize. The prize always gives to at maximum three PIs, uh, which is a shame because as I'll discuss later, there are a lot of people in this field who've made major contributions. And unfortunately, the Nobel Prize can't capture that. So I hope we can uh, honor them as well, because at least this field as a family has sort of come into its own and been recognized for this award. And Munji is a great uh, example of someone who's contributed quite a bit, but there are others. So uh, Ekimov is, uh, is lauded for discovering the size effects in copper halides. I'm going to talk about the size effects and the physics of that in a moment. Uh, Lou Bruce discovered these size effects in solutions of CDS and CDSE. These are uh, semiconductors, essentially like salts, but they um, bond together into crystal, large crystals that have semiconductor electronic properties. Uh, Ekimov discovered the size effect in copper halides, but these were in a solution of glass. So he was making glass, essentially like glass windows, and looking at the particles that were inside of it. Lou Bruce discovered how to do this in solution and looked at the size effect. And also, uh, between the two of them, they worked together with another uh, theoretical uh, physicist named uh, Al uh, Efros, or Al Efros, who, um, to come up with the physics and sort of what is the confinement effect and how do we capture uh, mathematically what is happening in these systems. Munji Buendi came along a little bit later. He was a postdoc of Lou Bruce uh, at IBM and discovered a synthesis route to produce monodisperse solutions of quantum dots. So while you can make samples of these in the 80s, you couldn't make them so they were all about the same size, which meant it was a little tricky to study the size effect of something that has a range of sizes within it. And you, know, you can look at statistics and, and things like this, but getting monodispersed solutions really opened up the field and changed everything. And that's what I hope to kind of convey to you today. So what is a quantum dot is our first uh, topic area. Well, and I apologize, this is really for like, is there anyone here who has no physics or chemistry background whatsoever, who's just interested and showed up? No, everybody's a physicist and a chemist, great. So I can talk to you like grown-ups. Uh, but they're, they're filming this, so I have to, you know, treat you guys as a, a very general audience. So in the world of the nanoscale, of course, uh, we know how big the Earth is, it's quite large. If we shrink that down, we can think about macro-scale objects, things that we're used to using every day, like a soccer ball. Shrink it down even further, so this would be maybe uh, a tenth or two-tenths of a meter. Shrink it down even further, and we can think of things, objects like red blood cells, cells in your body. This would be on the scale of eight times 10 to the negative six meters. And then uh, finally, we can think of nano-sized objects. And this is C60, is one of the first nanomaterials that was discovered and commonly worked with. And this is about 0.7 times 10 to the negative nine. 10 to the negative nine meters is a nanometer. That's where the nano comes from. And in general, when we talk about nanoscale objects, we're talking about objects between 100 nanometers and a nanometer. Below a nanometer, we start talking about simply atoms and a few atoms bonded together, small molecules. And above that, of course, we're talking about above 100 nanometers, these particles are big enough you could start to push them around and maybe even start to see them with the optical microscope. So it's what we call the mesoscopic area, which is uh, of interest. In this, uh, in this lecture. So uh, and what is a quantum dot? Well, a quantum dot is a chunk of crystalline material. You can see this is a CDSE, in the sense that I've drawn it on this red dot. But it's a crystalline, wartzite crystalline material made of inter interspersed uh, cadmium and selenium in a very orderly crystalline uh, pattern. This chunk of semiconductor uh, is the quantum dot, the functional part. And then it's surrounded by these ligands, which have uh, different parts, a head group, which attaches to the quantum dot and a tail group, which presents itself to the outside environment. By changing the different tail groups, you could change, for example, which solvents this material could be dispersed into. So these are aliphatic tail groups, so perhaps it could go into hexane. We can make different structures of the semiconductor part, which you can see in the TEM. So you can make them as rods, you can make them as spheroids, which we call quantum dots. You can make them as tetrapods. These are four stick figures that look kind of like a caltrops, if you guys are fans of Roman history. 
like everyone else apparently is at this time. Uh, and they have very interesting properties. So uh, tunable band edge, which we'll talk about in a moment, very broad absorption. They're semiconductors, so anything above the band edge should absorb very strongly. Again, we'll talk about what that means in a moment. And they also will emit light at a very specific frequency, which is um, associated with the band gap of the material. All right, again, we'll talk about what that is. We can functionalize them with different chemical uh, functional groups on the, t on the ends of the tail groups to change the way that they interact with their environment and even do chemistry to attach them to, say, dye molecules or other quantum dots. Uh, they tend to be good FRET donors and acceptors, so this is useful for biological labeling. And they have many other interesting physics topics that we don't have time to really cover. multi exciton generation, singlet fission harvesting, confinement effect, blinking, surface states, charge trapping, et cetera. And the key feature, after uh, sort of Lou Bruce discovered he could do this in solution, is that they're solution processable. What this means is, unlike a lot of semiconductors where you have to work with them using photolithography in a large vacuum system, you can put these into almost any solution you would like to, any solvent, and spray them, deposit them like ink, print them, stamp them, whatever you would like to do, you can deposit them. So this kind of meshes very well with organic electronics, which uses sort of a similar theme, where the materials can go into, say, an inkjet printer and be inkjet printed to make optoelectronics. So that part will come up, I think, uh, in a little bit. It's worth going over very briefly the history of nanomaterials. I'm not going to walk through the whole slide to kind of understand where the quantum dot fits in, uh, in the uh, history of our field. So uh, thousands of years ago, people were aware of the fact that if they mix certain chemicals together, they could make materials that had particular properties. Like, for example, the Romans would mix uh, metal and sulfide, say lead sulfide, and they made a black material, and they would spread it in their hair to dye their hair, which is not very wise, actually. Uh, maybe 1,500 to 500 years ago, gold nanoparticles were found. If you put them into glass and you cook it the right way, you could make a red stained glass. So you could make different colors and make these beautiful stained glass windows. People then didn't know what they were doing, but they did know that mixing things together produced a result, right? And uh, only later on did we realize that uh, they, what they were doing is making nanoparticles and then using these nanoparticles to sort of alter the technologies of their age, if you want to think of it that way. The actual nano field of nano started, in reality, with Richard Feynman saying there's plenty of room at the bottom, meaning that between a nanometer and 100 nanometers, there are all these different size regimes in which things could be happening that would be sort of different from bulk material chemistry, uh, sorry, different from bulk materials, but also slightly different from the molecules that are much smaller. Uh, I think we can skip ahead a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the buckyball was kind of the first important nanomaterial that people found and reported that got a lot of press. This was in the early 1980s. At the same time, uh, Ekimov and Lou Bruce were working on these small, uh, what they later called quantum dots, but at the time simply called very small uh, particles of, um, of material, including, uh, uh, as I said, Ekimov in a glass matrix and Lou Bruce looking at these materials in colloidal solutions. Uh, later on in the 80s, there were all these other discoveries that were happening with tools of nanomaterials discovery, things like the STM, the AFM, and the TEM, which was actually invented in the 30s when they discovered the electron, but had gotten much better over the years. And in the late 80s, was getting good enough that you could see, finally for the first time, you could see things on the nanoscale. And that was a critical kickoff for the field of nanomaterials, because finally you could actually evaluate by looking at it and doing crystallography and all the other um, techniques that we do in the, in the TEM, uh, what was actually happening with your material. So this is the connection that Ekimov and Lou Bruce made, is that they were making very small particles. They could see that, and they knew how small they were. And they were also looking at the optical properties changing. And by making that connection, they believed that they had discovered essentially the idea of the, qu the quantum dot, a term which was coined not until 1988, 1989. Um, which was this idea that as things got smaller, you would see these confinement effects, these optical effects, uh, as they shrunk smaller and smaller. So they'd finally found a material that sort of embodied this. This is why uh, the Nobel Prize is given in this area, is that it's a fundamental discovery. It ties to fundamental physics. It essentially recognizes nanomaterials as a field, which has been done one or two times earlier, right, with buckyballs and um, carbon nanotubes, et cetera, um, uh, graphene. But now uh, uh, the quantum dot has kind of come into its own, right? So this discovery is not very new, but its utility has only become sort of well understood in the last 10 years. And that's why the Nobel Prize has kind of crept up. Why is it useful? Well, in 1993, Chris Murray, Dave Norris, and Munji Buendi, these are his Munji students, 
reported uh, monodispersed samples via the hot injection. So this was a major step forward for making very uniform size material. There are all these other uh, sort of interesting things that were happening at Nano in the 90s. Uh, finally, you know, uh, transistors, CMOS became commercialized at less than 100 nanometers. Of course, uh, 20 years later, it's much smaller than that. And I'll point out that QD LEDs, the first one with 1% EQE, this was the seminal Nature paper by Seth Kosolfin and Wing Wu and Munji's group, was by 2013 commercialized to the Color IQ Bravia screen, which was Sony's uh, first screen in uh, 2013. So the quantum dot went from being sort of a science experiment to being something that could be commercially produced in large quantities to being good enough by 2001 that it started to actually make uh, LEDs that were not very efficient compared to OLED, which can be up to 20 to 25 percent efficient, uh, but just a little bit enough to get the early stage funding to commercialize it all the way 10 years, uh, sorry, 12 years later into something that can be sold. Okay. Nowadays, you can go down to the big box store and buy a quantum dot TV from many different brands. And so this has become sort of a widespread technology. Whether or not you're aware of it, I don't know how much uh, the students spend on new TVs. Uh, I, also, I also rarely buy a new TV. I did get one for my mom because she, you know, they won the Nobel Prize. So it's all right. OK, so uh, the other things are happening at the same time with nanomaterials as well. All right, so let's talk about what makes the quantum dot unique a little bit. And for that, we have to reach back into our uh, first year textbook, if you're a physics student, or into, uh, I would suggest, Wikipedia, if you're not a student at all of physics and you really uh, are not terribly interested. You'll recall that uh, when you take atoms and you bond them into a regular crystal, crystalline pattern, the states that hold the electrons, these would be the orbitals, right, if you took high school chemistry, start to mix together. And when they mix together, they make a range of states that can exist at particular energies. We call these ranges of states bands. And the highest filled one that fills up with electrons is called the valence band. There are also areas in the, if we keep going up in energy, there are energies at which there are no states available to hold an electron, which means an electron cannot have that uh, energy. Uh, a little higher up, there's a bunch of empty bands. The first one is called the conduction band. So if we hit our semiconductor with a photon, it can excite an electron from the valence band all the way above the conduction band, right, if it has enough energy to go over that line. Once it goes over the line, it relaxes very quickly by releasing heat right to the edge of the conduction band. And then it's stuck for a very short period of time before it can find what is left behind, which we call a hole. So the missing electron is like a, a hole, right? There's, there's nothing there. It's something that we consider to be a virtual particle. It doesn't exist on its own, but if you sum up the changes in all the other electrons, you can see mathematically you can simply treat the hole as being a thing, OK? So what's left over is a hole. When the electron finds one of these holes, it can drop down into the hole, recombine, and recreate the unexcited, right, or the relaxed ground state. When it does that, a photon will come out that has the energy difference between the conduction band bottom and the top of the valence band. So that energy is very important. And different uh, semiconductors will have different band gaps, right? So they'll emit light at different wavelengths, depending on what material you have. Where the bands are and the, the band gap between them depend on what your crystal is made of. So you can change the identity of your crystal. But each crystal only has one band gap associated with it. There's another change that occurs, which is important for uh, materials. In uh, three dimensions, we can talk about the density of states. And the density of states says, well, right at the conduction band, how many states are really at that energy? And a little further above the conduction band, there are usually more states that are available. So we want to talk about how many states we have at these different energy levels for a uh, three-dimensional material, a bulk material where essentially the electrons, the charges, don't feel the sides of the material. We have a density of states that looks kind of like this curve. It's continuous, and it only cuts out when you reach the band gap energy, right? Then there are no states, and then there's another uh, sort of symmetric uh, density of states for the valence band, OK? If we start to change our dimensions, so now we shrink our material down so it's two-dimensional effectively, which means that at least on two of the sides, the charges can feel the edges, our density of states will also change. So now it becomes a step function. If it's a one-dimensional material, so now it's confined in two dimensions and continuous in one dimension, it has sort of a uh, exponential decay looking curve. 
Okay? And when we get down to zero dimensions, this means the charges, the wave functions of the charges can feel the sides in every single dimension. The density of states decreases even further to just a, uh, a delta function, which is kind of a spike. So we have a very, very set energy at which we're going to find our state. And our density of states has thinned out, so we have very few states that are at the conduction band edge. So both these things are very important to understand what is happening with the quantum dot. First, we'll talk about the quantum size effect. So this is the, uh, you can see the density of states, how many states are available, becomes very, very small, a discrete function uh, at very discrete energies, that is very set energies and not at other ones, near the band edge. So in a bulk material, we can draw bands that look like this, where there are a lot of states available right when you're at the valence band, and again, right when you're at the conduction band. Uh, once we get below, I'll say about 10 nanometers, getting into the mesoscopic, in the mesoscopic range, Instead, now we have discrete, almost molecular-like states. You can see over on the right side I've drawn a molecule, which has perfectly discrete states, uh, with electrons filling those states. And you could excite one up, and it could then fall down. Right? Here, we have molecular-like states at the edges. And this gives rise to the features that we see in the absorption spectrum of the quantum dot. Away from the conduction band edge, though, we still have this nice continuous band of states. So we have all these absorbing states that are possible, which is why we get this very broad absorption in the blue in the UV. Very broad and very strong absorption in the, in the UV. The other size effect that's important is the confinement effect. And in the confinement effect, we have to, again, consider that we've now shrunk the material down so that the electrons, which you'll recall from quantum mechanics, or from Ant-Man, perhaps, if you're more familiar <laughs> with popular uh, science, uh, exists as a wave at the nanoscale. So these are extremely small light particles. So their wave function is what we consider when we place them into a, very, into a, a particular position. And the wave function describes the probability of finding that uh, particle at a particular position. When we're at the edge of this well, so we've drawn a little well where the electron can't leak out over here and it can't leak out over here, the whole wave function has to be inside the well. Now, if the well is very broad, the wave function can have a very broad curve in any of the, essentially, the first uh, uh, ground state. Uh, it looks kind of like a sine function. And the edges are zero. That is, you're not going to find the electron right at the edge. And in the middle, you have a very high likelihood of finding the electron. If we shrink the well down to be very, very thin, well, now we have the same, uh, the, the curve looks the same, but now it's a wave function with a much smaller wavelength, right? Which means it has a higher frequency. Frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional, which means that it has a higher energy. So what we get when we calculate this, uh, what we call particle in a box. That is, we've taken an electron, shoved it in a tiny box, and now it only has a very few number of wavelengths before it uh, interacts with the edge of the box. When we make it much smaller, now the distance between the different states starts to get much larger, right? And the energies get a little bit higher. So what happens is the first state for the hole and the first state for the electron get further apart in energy. When they get further apart in energy, when the electron collapses to fill in the hole, essentially, when, uh, when it emits a, a photon, the photon will be higher energy than the one with the wider well, okay? Which means it will be a bluer photon. So what we found is an effect where, based on the size, this is, uh, say, for CDSE, right? the bulk band gap of CDSE is around 715 nanometers if it were to emit a photon. Uh, a very large particle will have red emission because it's a very big well. Right? The electron is delocalized inside the quantum dot, but it can't escape outside because the ligands essentially are uh, much higher in energy. When it uh, is decreased in size, you squeeze the electron and hole wave functions in a much smaller box. Now they get further apart in energy for those first two states. So now uh, decay from the first uh, electron state to the valence band state uh, is now much bluer. So it emits much higher energy. Okay? And we can see this in the absorption spectrum as we look at these. These are the absorption spectrum curves for CDSE at different sizes. This is from Chris Murray's. PhD thesis. And he and Dave Norris and uh, Sherry Kagan and Munji's early students were the first people to really uh, understand this effect um, for colloidal nanocrystals made with the hot injection method. And this means they could see very, very tight, um, very monodispersed samples. You can see even some of the higher excited states in these different peaks on these curves. And they were able to sort of track this uh, change in the first absorption peak. That would be excitation from here to here uh, for different sizes. This is called the confinement effect. 
This means using the confinement effect, we can look at all these different semiconductor materials, in fact, any semiconductor material that you can produce uh, colloidally. And whereas this uh, arrow part, sort of the back end of the arrow, is the bulk band gap. Originally, you know, 50 years ago, if you had, you would have to pick a new semiconductor and would have to wind up having the emission that you wanted in order to use it in an emission application. But with this size tuning, you can take any bulk material and make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Sorry, the, uh, the circles are the bulk band gap. And make it smaller and smaller and smaller. And the energy that you're able to target is, uh, goes higher and higher, right? So let's say we take, um, uh, I like CDSE. <laughs> CDSE is pretty red. We can also tune it by making it smaller and smaller and smaller up into the green and, in fact, even into the blue. Okay, so now we have a material where it's the same material, but the size is determining what the optical properties are. Lou Bruce was the one who came up with the, what's called the Bruce equation, which uh, relates the effective band gap. That's the band gap you see as your first absorption peak or your emission peak. These are closely related, but offset by uh, maybe 10 or 15 nanometers. Uh, as your bulk band gap plus a term that has to do with the wave functions of the uh, electron and hole being crammed into a closer vicinity, and also an electrostatic attraction term. Because again, the electron and hole on average are now closer together than they normally would be. And this allows you to calculate actually what you would expect your band gap to be. OK, so we, we kind of talked through who the winners are. Munji Buendi is a professor at MIT. Lou Bruce was at uh, Columbia University for many years. I think he's retired now. Uh, Alexei Ekimov uh, was in the Soviet Union. Whoop, did I get rid of the slide that had their affiliations? No, no, no. He was at the Vasilov State Optical Institute. Uh, in Leningrad. He came over to the US and started, I think it was Nanocrystal Technologies was the name of his company. And uh, he's been there for many years. Um, I'll talk about sort of, when I talk about the notables, I'll talk about sort of what, what role that played. Uh, but Wendy is still at MIT. I don't think he's retiring soon, I hope. And uh, Lou Bruce, uh, as I said, has somewhat retired. So that's the contribution that Lou Bruce and Alexei Ekimov, and to a lesser degree, Munji Buendi contributed to. Munji was uh, Lou Bruce's postdoc at the time. Later on, uh, Munji set off on his own at MIT, and he was able to make these very monodispersed samples with his student, Chris Murray, who's now a professor at UPenn, and uh, Dave Norris, who's at uh, ETH Zurich today. And uh, all these notables in the field contributed strongly. I, I hope you don't take, don't take too many pictures, because if I forgot somebody, I'll be, I'll be cast out. <laughs> uh, I think I got them as many as I could think of. Uh, those are his students. Later on, uh, Munji had students Wing Wu, who I'm going to talk about, and Jonathan Steckel. Uh, Wing Wu and Johnny Steckel made the quantum dots for the first quantum dot LEDs. And so they were important in that uh, sense. Jonathan Steckel was also, uh, along with Seth Sullivan, who was the engineer who made the devices, uh, co-founded QD Vision, which was a very important company, uh, not necessarily for the money they made, but really for pushing the technology along and, uh, and making sort of quantum dots a standard part of what they use in displays. Uh, Paul Livasada, so Munji won the Nobel Prize, Lou Bruce, Alexei Ekimov won it. Uh, AL Sa or Sasha Efros um, is at uh, NRL. Uh, was the guy who came up with the fine structure of the exciton and did a lot of the physics, along with Dave Norris in Dave Norris's thesis, uh, and with uh, Munji Buendi as well. So they kind of came up with how to apply this directly to CDSE in particular, and then generalize that to CDS and other 2.6 materials. Paul Livasados is extremely famous in our field, maybe one of the biggest people, rivaling even Munji, to be honest, um, in terms of his contribution and all the many materials he's worked on. Uh, shape control, lots of different materials, nanorods, tetrapods, almost every technology associated with it, he's done a lot of work on. Uh, Philippe Guillaucinet worked a lot on the core shell coating. He was the first to report that and has worked a lot on the physics of these quantum dots. Victor Klimov at Los Alamos did a lot of physics and optics, lasing. He worked for a long time on multi exciton generation, which is getting more than one excitation per particle. Um, and recently, electroluminescent uh, lasing from CDSE nanocrystals. And of course, Horst Veller, who at University of Hamburg also worked on synthesis shape control. All these different aspects of the nanocrystal synthesis that are important. Andre Rogosh was Horst Veller's student. Everybody knows him from City U. He's uh, very famous in, our, in Hong Kong. CDTE LEDs, perovskites, he does pretty much everything. Uh, Yuri Bannon, Xiaogang Peng are very well known for their nanomaterials work. There are many other notable contributors who are not the children, if you will, of the five fathers, as we call them, the, and their descendants. Uh, people like Liberato Mana, uh, Neil Greenham, who I also worked for, Perovskites, LEDs, 
intellectual properties. And uh, Vladimir Bolovic. So Vladimir Bolovic is also extremely uh, important in the field. He was the engineering, his was the engineering group that made the first quantum dot LEDs. And now, of course, they do quantum dot solar cells, photodetectors, other things. So half of, uh, I put myself up here, but I don't really deserve <laughs> to walk in the shadow of, uh, of these uh, luminaries. Uh, but it's my talk, so I get to talk about myself. Uh, QD synthesis, I did a lot of high PLQI, so high photoluminescent quantum yield, red, green, and blue quantum dots, and many different device types. And when I did that work, it was in the lab of Vladimir Bolovich. Uh, so the synthesis in Munji's lab and the device work was all done in Vladimir's lab. And Vladimir and Munji were the two big backers who kind of pushed uh, QD Vision, which was this company that came out of the quantum dots to make TV screens later on. So I'll talk a little bit about Seth and uh, Johnny, who co-founded this uh, company. And I joined the group uh, about two or three years after Johnny Steckel. And uh, so after he graduated, I kind of took over a lot of his portfolio. And that's my contribution, is that he and uh, Seth really put together the first organic uh, quantum dot LEDs with two organic layers and a monolayer in between them. Later on, we worked on a lot of different device types that I'll point out. And basically, we patented everything. QD Vision licensed everything. And they went off and developed their technology from there. So since uh, Munji's seminal paper, this is Mur Chris Murray in JAX 1993, I just searched the words uh, colloidal quantum dot, colloidal semiconductor nanocrystal, and anything very, very, very closely related that mixes up all those words. And you can see that this is a massive field, right? In, uh, since uh, the early uh, 90s, it has grown to be about 10,000, you know, 9,400 papers per year on this topic alone. And this is... Uh, not including perovskite necessarily, which of course would be a, another large, massive field. So uh, I just got this out of Web of Science. Lou Bruce's paper doesn't actually qualify because the term quantum dot hadn't been invented when he came up with his first paper in 1982 and reported. All right, so uh, all that happened in 1993, right? We made the first hot injection uh, quantum dot prep. So what have we been doing for 30 years? Well, it turns out that the material you make from the hot injection isn't necessarily very useful. However, it was much more useful than what had been made before. So the hot injection synthesis uh, takes the idea of the what, Lemaire, what we call the Lemaire process, where you take uh, precursor materials, you achieve a high concentration and a high temperature, and suddenly you start to get the formation of small nuclei that form in what's called burst nucleation. They then start to grow, and the concentration in the solution starts to decrease as it builds up the surface of these materials. Eventually, when your concentrations are even, now the ligands will pluck material off the surface and maybe take from the little ones and give to the big ones, and you move into a, a phase called Ostwald ripening. So if you cut your prep, that is, you turn off the temperature and cool it down very quickly, stop the reaction from happening in this growth phase, at any point in the growth phase, by looking at the material uh, taking the uh, UV vis, finding that first absorption peak, you can basically cut the prep off at whatever size you want to make. So if you want to make them blue emitting, green emitting, yellow emitting, orange emitting, red emitting, you simply have to stop the reaction at the right point. And they should be essentially all the same size. The innovation here, which uh, Chris Murray gets a lot of credit for it because he was a real um, student of colloidal processes, uh, is that instead of taking the material and just heating it all up, Right? And then uh, as you reach the threshold, you'll get some nucleation, but some stuff won't be reacting yet. Later on, you get more nucleation. That will spread out the growth phase. So you have early nuclei growing big, late nuclei growing not so big, and then you have a wide range of sizes. What Chris Murray did is he put this cadmium precursor in the pot, and he took, this is a triactylphosphine uh, selenide, in a syringe, and at 320 degrees, injected the whole solution and you have to have your stirring is really important. Your stirring has to be going very, very quickly, not be disrupted. And if you can do that, uh, which takes a little bit of engineering, right? You have to buy the right stir bars, the right stir pads, the whole thing. You can get uh, burst nucleation to happen almost immediately. And then the growth phase makes material, if you have the right ligands, um, as essentially completely monodisperse. There's very few variations, OK? This allows you both to study the material in a much better way but also just to make better quality material. Okay? If you want to separate it, uh, what they found is they could centrifuge the material. So it starts out in a growth solution with leftover precursor. You add in a solvent it doesn't like, they'll all stick together, what we call aggregation. You can then centrifuge them to the bottom of the tube, throw out the supernatant, uh, redisperse them in something like hexane, right, with those aliphatic tail groups, 
that it'll go into and make a solution. You can do this several times to clean these up for electronic purposes, right? So they have to be fairly clean. It is important that this process goes well because when you create these uh, nanoparticles, uh, you also have to bear in mind that the ligands that are attached to the surface are not bound so tightly that they can't fall off. If you pull off the ligands or you lose your ligands, you wind up creating these surface states that are essentially what we call unpassivated, which means that they have energies that are inside the band gap. So if we excite an electron to the band gap, it can fall into one of these trap states and then either non-radiatively decay or worse, it can decay with emission, right, which is essentially trap state emission. So you get kind of an orangey tail to your very nice blue particles that you spent. It takes about three hours to do this properly. About three hours trying to make. So this was a big problem. If we wanted to use these for absorption processes, that's fine. It doesn't really change anything. But if you want to use them for emission, it's a problem. You've also created a pathway by which you're losing excitations from your nanocrystals without making the blue light that you wanted, perhaps, for your display. So the, one of the key innovations that happened around 1998, 99, this is uh, Melissa Hines, uh, who's now a professor herself, working for Philippe Guillaucinet. I told you I'd talk about the five fathers several times, right? So that's why I gave you their names. Uh, figured out how to put a shell on the material. So we took the, she took the CDSE core and made a CDSE zinc sulfide core shell nanocrystal. So in the core shell nanocrystal, the core is still CDSE, but the shell is now zinc sulfide. And there are, again, ligands, uh, you can imagine them, surrounding this material so that it will also disperse well in solution. When you do that, you fill in all the surface trap sites. And you also isolate, uh, because this is what we call type 1, the uh, excited state will sit in the CDSE core. And it's kind of quantum mechanically isolated from trap states that could still exist on the surface. And so this kind of keeps it in in the core long enough that you can get it to decay uh, and emit light. And so these are quantum yields. Quantum yield is how many photons you excite with, how many emitted photons at the color you want you get. The cores might be about 30%. That's very good for optical purposes if you want to do a laser study. It's not so good for making devices. Here, uh, this was all the examples I took from my own uh, thesis for the most part. Here, you put a shell on it. It got a little bit thicker, probably from some alloying at the surface. But the quantum yield of the growth solution is now 75%. All right, this is a particle that you could maybe use for emissive purposes. My students are kind of laughing because nowadays we can do 90%, right, 95% without too much difficulty. Uh, they're laughing because I think it's easy. <laughs> uh, after you uh, precipitate it, you do lose some ligands, so you can lose a little bit of emission anyway. All right, so now we have particles. Uh, by around 2000, 2001, we had nanocrystals that could really be used for these emissive purposes that had high photoluminescence quantum yield. So why would you make uh, a display out of them? Well, at the time, the organic molecules that they use to make displays have a mission that's fairly uh, broad, right? So it's about 100 nanometers, um, maybe uh, 60 nanometers full with half max, right? Uh, for the green one, it's also reasonably uh, broad for the molecular dye. For the red one, it's very broad, although that's less of an issue. If you take these colors and you represent them on a two-dimensional triangle called the, uh, we call it the color triangle, but it's a CIE diagram, uh, and you write the, uh, the, the um, dimensions in x and y coordinates of the blue, the red, and the green emitter that you've made, then you can draw a triangle between those three points. All the colors inside the triangle, you can fool the human eye into believing are being represented on the screen. So the way that you mix these three colors, you can make every color that's sort of inside it. But you can't make the colors that are outside the triangle. And the reason is that these are very broad peaks. And so they, as they're hitting, say, your green receptor, they're also a little bit hitting your blue receptor. right? So it simply can't trick you into, look the, into the fact that you're looking at a very saturated color. The quantum dot has a very thin line width of emission. And this is because essentially they're semiconductors and they're all the same size. This means we can draw a much larger triangle and we can make much more, many more colors on the screen than the organic dyes were able to do. And there are fundamental reasons why you have uh, large widths full with half max of these dyes that can't be solved with simple chemistry. Whereas with the quantum dots, they're semiconductors, they're floating in solution, they can be extremely thin. So the idea uh, that uh, Bolovich and uh, Seth Kosolvin and Wing Wu had at first was to build a, uh, essentially an LED, an organic LED, where you have a whole transport layer, an electron transport layer, and then to smash the quantum dots in the middle. Normally, you would get emission from either the ETL or the HTL 
in an organic LED. Now they were hoping to make a lot of these electron hole pairs called excitons very close to the quantum dot monolayer or inside the quantum dots themselves and then get the emission from the quantum dots. So they could do this with uh, uh, red, green, and blue, but the efficiency is very, very low, where the efficiency is measured for every electron you inject into your device, how many photons do you get at the color that you want, okay? 2% uh, means most of your current is essentially wasted generating heat, all right? So that, that's uh, uh, how did they do this? Uh, let me see if I've got enough time to tell you. Uh, they build quantum dots at MIT. They have this, actually, it's a train, so they have these uh, glove boxes where they can work air free, uh, build the devices. I'm going to show you how they do the deposition in a moment. Uh, they'll put it on a little trolley. The trolley then runs automatically to each station, and it can pick up, say, sputtered material, evaporated materials, evaporated metals, whatever it is you would like through a vacuum tunnel. It's very clever. I wish we had this here. I'm looking at my department heads over there. Okay. So uh, how do we make them? Well, you can essentially take this as a solution, spin it onto a film, let the solvent evaporate. So we spin it onto a stamp, and then we take the stamp, and we have this uh, organic HTL. Organic materials are very sensitive, so we don't want to put the solvent directly on the organic. And then you can stamp down a nice monolayer of these quantum dots, peel off the stamp, the quantum dots stick to the HTL, and you have a fairly nice monolayer of dots. And then you can evaporate on the ETL, evaporate on the metal, et cetera. When we do this, we have all these uh, processes that are going on in the LED. We have charge injection, where uh, electrons and holes are injected into the conduction band and valence band to form excited states we call an exciton. We might also form excitons in the organic layer, but that's OK, because we have something called uh, FRET, or force of resonant energy transfer, by which the energy can still get into the quantum dot and emit with the emissive um, wavelength of the quantum dot. These are competing with Auger decay, in which you charge up your quantum dot, then when you form an exciton, the energy transfers to the other charge. It goes up to a high energy state and then loses energy as heat and essentially returns to a charged dot. So not only is it still charged, but you've lost your exciton. Um, and also charge extraction, where if you put a very high voltage on the quantum dots, the charges might just hop out before you actually get uh, the electron hole to recombine. OK, so we need to uh, fix some of these processes and improve them. And we found that uh, with a lot of different chemistry, not only could we use size tuning to change the color, but we could also do composition tuning. For example, zinc selenide is a very blue emitting material. Uh, CDSE, I told you already, in the bulk is red. When we mix the materials together at the same size, we get sort of an intermediate, a green emitter. And if we change the size, we can make it bluer or make it more yellow. We can use band alignment to also achieve uh, different emission states. So we, I told you about the type 1 configuration, where you have a wide energy band on the exterior shell, and this sort of traps the excited state in the core. We can also offset these bands, and now the hole will be trapped in the core, and the electron will be trapped in the shell. When they recombine, they recombine with this energetic distance between this conduction band and this valence band. So you can take, say, CDSE, which is fairly red, ZNSC, which is fairly blue, and make a type two structure together and get green emission from the mixture of the two. Uh, finally, uh, you can do things like add in dopants, like manganese is a good dopant. It creates a highly localized phosphor state. When you excite the quantum dot, the energy drops into the phosphor state and you can emit from the phosphor. And you can play tricks also with sort of the crystal structure. The other thing we can do is dimensional control, where um, say this is a quantum dot, a zero dimensional particle. Uh, we can also make nano rods, so we can make them one-dimensional. This has changes to the energy structure and also creates the interesting effect of polarized emission, which is very useful for a lot of LCD um, applications. You can make them very or infinitely long, make them into nano wires. You can also make little plates, 2D nano platelets, where essentially they're confined in uh, just one dimension. And again, by shrinking the size, you can play with the confinement effect to alter the emission properties a little bit. And finally, with uh, some of the materials we work with now, particularly perovskites, we can do things like Ruddleston popper that are interdigitated uh, masses of semiconductor separated by, you can think of it as layers of a cake, separated by ligand layers that inter interdigitate in the case of Ruddleston popper, or essentially uh, connect on both sides in the case of the Dion Jacobson stacks. So playing all these tricks, we can make all these materials and make them very, very bright. We can maximize both the color to get the widest color triangle we want, and also the photoluminescence um, quantum yield to make them as bright as possible. And uh, this is just a range of the different materials I made. Uh, I made all these 
<laughs> back in uh, 2000, probably 2006, 2007. Some of the perovskites we made maybe 10 years ago in my group, seven years ago in my group, and uh, some of the doped materials. You can just see that they make these very nice, bright solutions. Um, we also found other ETLs and HTLs. So now, rather than doing this stamping process, which is a little fiddly, we can make as thick a layer of quantum dots as we might like. So we can make much thicker layers by dropping them directly onto the HTL or ETL, drawing the solution, making the film, and then afterwards we can evaporate uh, the electrode uh, to make the circuit, to make the LED. Okay. So what I personally did, and I'm only saying this again to kind of clarify my role, uh, after the organic uh, QD LEDs were sort of invented, and uh, Johnny Steckel and Seth Kosolvin spun off this company called QD Vision. So me and uh, Polina and Akeva and a few of the, my other partners in the Boindi group uh, went about building all the other device types we could think of, inorganic LEDs, white light LEDs, brighter blue, so we got that 0.2% to be over 1%, uh, nanorod OLEDs, inkjet printed nanorods, AC driven, uh, these are these doped dots that nobody had used before. AC-driven infrared quantum dot eyelids. So we made all these different weird device types. We patented all this stuff. And then, of course, QD Vision licensed all the patents, which is a blessing and a curse, right? Because uh, there were no more companies to be spun off. And I can tell I did something important in life because it's on Wikipedia. And I didn't put it there, <laughs> I will point out. Uh, so if you look at the definition of a quantum dot, you can read all about it if you'd like to. The picture here, I think this was um, uh, Wen Hao Lu, uh, told me one day he wanted to make a rainbow. And I said, OK, well, what colors do you need? Because I have all the colors, right? Because I was the LED guy. And he's like, oh, uh, you know, something a little bluer and something a little redder. So I had very red and very blue. So I gave him these samples, and he you know, took a nice picture. And uh, it's on the internet, so it's got to be the truth, right? OK. There you go, guys. That's what I did. OK, so at the end of um, sort of uh, 2008, 2009, as I was transitioning out of the Boendi group, uh, we had made these white light emitters. We had made a very wide color triangle, all these different points. Uh, later on, uh, QD Vision was essentially taking all this IP, turning it into products that they could use to make um, displays. And the display they came up with, this was in 2013, was the first commercialized display. This was by uh, Sony their Triluminos display. Um, Munji has a big one of these as an, a demo on his wall. I don't know if it still works, to be honest. Uh, the quantum dots didn't last as long as we would have liked back in the day. What is unique about this versus what I've already told you is that rather than using this sort of charge injection to get light directly, what we call direct charge injection um, LEDs, instead they use a backlight, a blue backlight, and the quantum dots simply absorb the blue light and then emit their, uh, their characteristic color. So it's, well, I'll call this in this uh, a QD sort of emission filter, right? So it filters the blue light, turns it into RGB emission. Uh, I have an, this is a bad example because it's actually using a different quantum dot. Uh, it's not CDSE. But uh, I have this in my slides, and I did it recently, so I feel like I'll tell you about it. Um, so this is sort of an inkjet printing. We take these quantum dots. These are perovskite quantum dots. We have a very nice green and a nice red. We can print them into a pattern, so we make essentially red, green, and nothing. And then we have a black blue, a blue backlight, and the blue light shines through the layer. The green and the red absorb it. The green emits green. The red emits red. The blue that simply comes through just looks blue. Uh, this is an example of a green-blue two-color display we did. Uh, that's the Kung Fu Panda as I'm sure everyone under 40 <laughs> knows all about, <laughs> and anyone with kids, right? No idea. You, you guys didn't see Kung Fu Panda? No. Ant-Man? <laughs> ah, I see, I see. I think I'm over 40, too. Sad as that. OK, let's uh, so, <laughs> so what happened, right? Well, we spent all this time working on QD LEDs, and the technology actually wasn't efficient enough early enough to get adopted. Instead, uh, all these companies got started. So this is QD Corp. That was the first quantum dot company. It was spun out of Munji's lab. I made Munji's companies purple for some reason. Uh, Nanosys. So QD Corp got sold to Molecular Probes. And Invitrogen then bought up essentially all of Molecular Probes and all of their IP. You can still get these biological, these are biolabeling probes um, from uh, Invitrogen, I believe. And you can find them on Sigma or um, pretty much anywhere. Uh, so Munji uh, was a little disappointed because they didn't make any money. And uh, like every company, they spent all their 
money, racked up all this debt. Uh, the debt got paid off, but none of the people with shares made really any cash. This is how companies work, in case you're one of these raring uh, you know, startup people. Um, it doesn't usually work out. So uh, Munji tacked on with the other five fathers. They all got together and built a company together with uh, the CEO, who was kind of this go-getter, went and talked to everybody. And he built Nanosys out in California. Nanosys was going to make these QDEFs, these QD emission filters. Uh, but they started out actually making solar cells, because that's where they thought the value of the quantum dots would be, not realizing that in 2010, all this money came up in the US and in China to essentially make solar very cheap. China is now pounding out silicon solar cells, so you really can't compete with almost any technology. And the one you can compete with is perovskite. That has nothing to do yet with quantum dot at this stage. So by 2008, they were kind of disappointed with solar and with photodetector. They were kind of limping along on government contracts to just do basic research. And they hit upon the idea of doing these QDEFs, and they felt they had enough IP, because they had licensed as much as they could from before 2001, um, that they could achieve this. In 2004, uh, Johnny Steckel and Seth Kosfold Sullivan founded QD Vision. Johnny graduated, I think, 2005, so he had two jobs for a little while. Uh, Evident was also founded. That was Xiao Gang, I believe that was Xiao Gang Peng's company, uh, University of Arkansas. And at the same time, a lot of, I use Evident as an example, a lot of what we call dot shops got founded. And these were small companies that were going to make quantum dots and sell them as a chemical component ostensibly to somebody who wanted them. But nobody really wanted them in 2004 because they didn't know what they were for or what they did. So a lot of these dot shops just kind of limped along for a while and eventually went out of business. I'm not sure what the final um, fate of Evident was. Uh, QD Vision actually started doing QD LED. They did make an RGB display. It was very beautiful. The um, lifetime was very short, however. So you can't make a TV screen that only lasts for 3,000 hours. Right? That's barely enough time to get through, uh, I don't know, Seinfeld? <laughs> What's your favorite TV show? How old am I? All right. So uh, they started instead looking at the lighting market, and they were able to make, uh, you know, change the light that was coming out of a white light phosphor uh, by some little bit. And that could be good for growing, say, tomatoes, right, hydroponics, or it could be good for indoor lighting. Of course, nowadays we know we have ultra cheap. Uh, phosphors made by Philips that don't really require quantum dots. So that market never really took off as they'd wanted to. Uh, then they started making QD emission filters because they realized this is what the TV screens, the ones that already existed, the LCDs, you could just slip in this color filter, remove the organic color filter, and you don't have to change anything about the rest of the stack or the process. So it's very easy to get companies to partner with this technology. Uh, Nanosys found a few companies. Um, and QD Vision eventually found, uh, at first, Sony, but they decided to back, sorry, with the first commercial display. That was in 2013. Sony then backed out of the market and stopped selling quantum dots in 2014. Later on, Philips, Samsung, all the other big companies got into it. Samsung finally purchased all of QD Vision's LED patents that they had licensed from MIT. MIT doesn't usually sell patents. Samsung made an offer they couldn't refuse, purchased all the IP. And they were using that IP because they were all getting sued. So first, Nanosys sued QD Vision for using their quantum dot emission filter. Have no illusions, my friends. <laughs> Business is not science. <laughs> it's not even really technology, right? First, they sued QD Vision. QD Vision sold out to a bigger company that could defend the stuff. Then uh, Nano, whoop, Nanoco, which uh, I had forgotten about, but had been founded also in 2001. They had this really uh, you know, far-sighted vision that they were going to make quantum dots, but without the cadmium. And they were going to make them as bright as the cadmium ones. And of course, no one else who uses cadmium is beautiful. I mean, it works so well. But cadmium is banned in the EU, and it's also banned in Japan and a few other markets. That's enough to not want to invest in the technology for uh, display. So uh, eventually, Nanoco's uh, cadmium-free quantum dots, they had a big win, where actually they were selling, uh, in 2008, um, cadmium as well as cadmium-free to Sigma Aldrich. Nobody on Earth knew what to do with quantum dots in 2008 either. So Sigma didn't really sell a lot of these. But you could finally find what you were working on for sale on the chemical company website. Uh, then they, uh, finally they sued Samsung, who had purchased all this IP so they wouldn't have to pay Nanoco. And they did have to pay Nanoco. They settled in 2023. However, if you go in the big box store, as you can see, by the, about 2018, 2020, Quantum dot technology was becoming very prominent in all the LCD screens. And today, we have a number of different technologies 
that include quantum dots. These are classical uh, OLEDs, so these are QD OLEDs, where the OLEDs are, in this case, I think actually a backing backlight, where the OLED is a blue light behind it. Uh, you can also get QD LED, where they use these um, in actual electroluminescent, sorry, this one, actual electroluminescent displays. You can get what's called micro LED, where you have different tiny LED, blue LEDs behind each one. When you turn off the blue LED behind each pixel, it looks really black, so you get very nice contrast between the bright and the dark parts of the uh, spectrum. And finally, you can use these for transparent displays, flexible displays, stretchable displays, all the other things that you might uh, consider wanting. In addition, you can use uh, red, green, and blue to make white light by mixing red, green, and blue. It will fool your eye, because those are the three detectors in your eye, and these are sort of your detection absorber, the absorption of your detectors in your eye. You can fool your eye into thinking white light is being shined on it. So if you want to make white emission, you simply mix those three colors. And uh, we made some QD LEDs out of these, so we made some white light emitters, made some nice bright white uh, pixels. Uh, these are all the different engineered particles we used. Uh, we use all the tricks in the book to improve quantum yield, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, QD Vision actually sold a, uh, a QD enhanced color filter, uh, where they use the quantum dots to get a little more red light and make these white lights a little bit warmer. Again, they were thinking of doing hydroponics. Eventually, they had to exit this market. And the last uh, major application is really uh, these biological applications that I'm going to talk about very little, because I'm really not a biology guy and I'm out of time. Uh, so quantum dots can be used in therapy, biomedical, clinical, drug research for things like cell imaging, cell labeling, biosensing, molecular imaging. You can inject them into a mouse and essentially uh, model either different tissue types or um, visualize sort of the, uh, the veins that go into, for example, a cancer uh, tumor. Uh, this was a, uh, one of Munji's recent papers on this topic. He has many, many, many diagrams of mice cut open with infrared emission. So you can make infrared emitting quantum dots. And you can look at the emission with special goggles coming out of different organs of the mouse. It's not a lot of fun for the mice. I uh, tried my hand at this one time uh, with some of my blue uh, quantum dots. And the uh, MD PhD who took them from me told me it killed the mouse in four seconds, which is uh, the fastest he'd ever seen. So that was the end of my biological career. OK. <laughs> uh, biological applications. So uh, Munji actually spun out another company called LumiCell. And uh, you know, he was very active in, in taking the technology and pushing it out of the lab. And I think that also sort of uh, bolstered his claim to making quantum dots something that are uh, extremely necessary in life. So this is uh, um, where the surgeon wears special glasses. The quantum dots emit infrared light from the tumor edges. So when you cut out the tumor, you can see tumor material is still around the ragged edges of the wound. And maybe you cut out a little bit more, but not too much. Right? This is what the surgeons want to do. So this helps you while you're doing the actual surgery, not me, um, and therefore allows you to do a better job clinically in curing the patient. And uh, this company, like all of Munji's companies, I don't believe made any money, but it took a terrific technology and put it into the mainstream. And so now all this stuff is really well commercialized. And if you look at what is really the big application for Quantum Dot, it's really these uh, commercial displays. The quantum dots are into everywhere. So if you go, you have, maybe you didn't notice this before, but if you go to the store and you look at how many display technologies are using quantum dot or not using quantum dot, it's a very high percentage. I would say maybe 50%, depending on um, which store you're in, as you walk from like display to display. OK. Don't worry, guys. I'm going to let you go. So what is the future? for quantum dots materials. Uh, well, I am a materials chemist, so I always think in terms of what material we're going to talk about next. Uh, CDSE, all the 2.6 materials, very famous materials that sort of made quantum dot what it is, especially the overcoated CDSE ZNS core shell material. There were all these uh, two, three, five materials, like indium phosphide, indium arsenide. I need to point out that all the work we did at MIT was somewhat in vain. Because NanoCo came up with these three, five materials and sold them, all the displays that you see, almost all the displays that you see in the big box store, they actually have indium phosphide in them. I have personally made actually every material that's on this board, uh, except for uh, probably the gallium one. But uh, we didn't make enough of this to, uh, to really turn it into the dominant technology. Again, because CDSE looked so good, nobody wanted to mess around with these very difficult 3.5 materials. 
By uh, 2014, it became clear, though, that uh, at least in terms of markets, cadmium is no go, right? So in 2014, uh, people had been working on these perovskites for solar cells uh, as bulk materials. Um, somebody named uh, Maxim Kovalenko uh, was the first to publish the nanocrystal form of these. So they made quantum dots out of perovskite. Now everybody makes quantum dots out of perovskite with different forms, RP, DJ, platelets, all kinds of different materials now, different crystal structures, what we call perovskites, double perovskites, triple perovskites, pseudo perovskites, or perovskite-like materials. And what my group does now, which is these uh, self-trapped emitters and some of the hybrid organic and inorganic materials. So that is where the, the academic field is going, making new materials, turning them into quantum dots, finding unique properties that can be used. I think we're really well over time, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead. Uh, this is just a perovskite crystal structure. When you mix that with a quantum dot, you take a material that has fast charge separation, long-lived charge species, with something that actually has very poor conduction. And uh, you can make a much better material for both LEDs and solar cells out of it. They make these very bright quantum dots. You can make them out of LEDs. These are LEDs from my group specifically, with actually pretty high EQEs were achievable pretty early on. All the lessons from CDSE were then applied to perovskite quantum dots. And now, again, they're being applied to the next generation quantum dots beyond that. So everything that was developed gets recycled and becomes new again as we discover new materials with new properties. I mentioned down conversion is still a big uh, consideration. And it's probably the next perovskite technology, not the direct charge injection LED. We can also find ways to use non-toxic materials. Uh, in this case, uh, copper is a good choice. Anything that uses halides or uh, sulfur selenium is probably OK. And we can make all these different copper-based quantum dots now. Uh, they're not really quantum dots, because they're not actually confined. And they have a very different emission mechanism. They're really semiconductor nanocrystals that are highly emissive. But all the chemistry is actually very similar. So turning them into making the material itself, processing it, purifying it, turning it into applications. So uh, these are uh, what are the other ideas. Well, Munji was asked this at his, um, you know, the, the committee likes to call you up on TV. And then reporters ask kind of inane questions about your work. And it was 6 AM. Munji actually did a really good job considering uh, how early it was in the day. I watched, I watched this because it was 6 PM our time. I was really uh, chuffed. They leaked the results early. So I found out at like 3.30 AM his time, which is about 3.30 PM our time. And I didn't know if it was real, but I was really excited. So I went home, ran home, and I made my kids watch. Uh, you know, to see if Quantum Dot was really going to be uh, the Nobel Prize. So he said new materials, which I agree with, sensing, especially IR imaging and chemical sensing. Quantum computing is a possible, and quantum sensing is a possible uh, application. And of course, biological and medical, especially therapeutic and biolabeling um, for uh, curing patients, right? OK. So these are your uh, 2023 winners of the Nobel Prize in chemistry. I hope you. Appreciate the work they did, you know, why they were chosen this year, why Quantum Dot has come into its own kind of in the last couple of years, why this is something that the world is really ready to absorb. And it's probably something you look at every day if you have a nice TV or will look at when you graduate, make a lot of money, and then you'll buy a nice TV. Okay? Buy a Quantum Dot TV. I want to thank all these people for their contributions to all the diagrams I've shown you to make the slides. And I'd be happy to take your questions. And sorry for running over. Thank you. So, uh, first here on the audience, at the back. So, uh, thank you for the talk. So, I have two uh, maybe very fundamental questions. Sure. So, the first question is uh, about the, in terms of band structure or energy levels. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, make uh, quantum dots so unique compared to the 1D atomic chain and 2D materials? And the second question is, uh, similar in terms of synthetic challenge, uh, synthetic challenge. So, what is the similarities and difference between the quantum dots and uh, the one one dimensional and two dimensional systems? Sure. So, uh, in the one dimensional and two dimensional systems, so for example, the one dimensional system. Now you have nearly continuous states in one dimension, right? So it's almost continuous, and then it's confined in the other two dimensions. So when you start mixing these states together. You wind up getting a slightly different uh, fine structure of the exciton that forms inside the CDSE. So for example, in, um, in CDSE, you have a dark state and then a bright state, which partially explains why the lifetime is really relatively long for a direct band emitter, and also why it's so bright. 
um, the position of the dark state, what we call the dark exciton and the bright exciton, will shift a little bit as you change the states by making the nanorod longer. So actually, the brightest nanoparticles, if you match them together at the right distance, energetic distance, the brightest nanoparticles are the ones that are slightly oblong. And that's because you've pushed the bright state down enough that thermally it can be activated very easily. So you don't wait around with a very long-lived state that will then uh, essentially not find ways to non-radiatively decay. Right? Um, so one of the other things that uh, uh, is for two-dimensional materials, again, you can see some confinement, but you have a little less control in terms of the range of uh, emission wavelengths that you can observe. Again, because you have essentially kind of continuous states feeding in with non-continuous discrete states, and you wind up getting a slightly different hierarchy of states in those materials. So each one has different properties uh, in terms of how bright they are, what the lifetimes look like, how long lived the exciton will be in a particular material. And it has to do with all the dimensions, how long it is, how likely you are to find trap sites on the surface, et cetera, et cetera. Does that answer? Partly your question, OK. And how about the synthetic part, the synthesis? OK. So making materials that are anisotropic is challenging. So you have to find conditions, or you have to find uh, ligands that are chemically, say, for example, uh, thermodynamically more likely to drop material on one end, so they'll react more strongly with one side than the other side. Or ones that are, essentially, they become kinetically hindered very easily. So they can only react with, say, a free edge, where the other edge is covered with, say, bulky ligands that prevent them from approaching. So by changing sort of the ligands, the reaction conditions, you can force it to either grow along one facet or maybe simply have to choose a facet on which it grows. So you can find a range of different crystals, uh, crystalline facets uh, that grow in one dimension. It depends a lot on what the material is, what the facets available are, what the ligands available are, how quickly the reaction occurs. All these things are very important for determining when you can get anisotropic growth. Generally, the conditions have to be very high concentration or feeding in additional material to keep the concentration high. And uh, two ligands, one that reacts well with one surface, but not quickly, and the other that reacts with another surface very quickly. So a bit of a follow-up to that, John. So with many of these uh, semiconductors, people may know the basic structure types. Uh, many are based upon uh, tetrahedrally coordinated mm -hmm. metals and non-metals, as you mentioned, 2, 6, and 3, 5, and so forth. Um, coming back to the anisotropic idea, mm -hmm. so we have structures like wurzite versus uh, the cubic, sphalerite, or zinc blend type structures. Yeah. Uh, how, how does that symmetry of the basic bulk material play into some of these things that you yeah, talked about? that's also very important, right? So wurzite has that nice face along which it'll grow very easily, the hexagonal face. Um, you can force it to grow in other ways. You can make, force it to become zinc blend, and then it'll grow in another facet. Actually, the tetrapods you saw uh, form because you have uh, initially a zinc blend core. So you grow it at the right temperature conditions that it forms a zinc blend. And then you force it to grow, essentially, wurzite arms off of the zinc blend facets. So that's where the tetrapod comes from, which is why it was observed accidentally well before the nanorods could be grown. you know, and, yeah, it's, um, it's very beautiful. You, well, well, I have one, a quick question. I'll come back to the audience. Um, at the very beginning, you showed that actually, uh, for individual materials, you have a certain band gap. And before this uh, quantum confinement effect came in, you had to kind of go with whatever the material was. Maybe you can add dopants and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you were, you were kind of fixed in what type of emission you'd have. But then you showed, oh, well, we can do it for all kinds of materials. Uh, so then just an obvious question that you kind of covered probably in, in that previous answer. But it would have seemed obvious even 20, 25 years ago that the cadmium and maybe later lead compounds were very toxic and would have a problem uh, coming into the marketplace. So technologically speaking, why was it that people didn't just transfer to other materials that were less toxic from an early stage? So the reason has to do with the, the specifics. So I, I glossed over a lot of the physics that you were really asking about. Um, it has to do with the specifics of the nanomaterial, um, how you wind up getting those bandage states, the nature of those bandage states, how they relate to each other and the fine structure. And for a number of reasons, CDSE just has the brightest material. It's very easy to work with. The three fives are much harder to make. They're a lot more covalently bound. 
Um, so they're just a little more difficult to get them to deposit properly without too many internal traps. So it's the ability to work with the material, exclude traps, make it look perfect, make it very monodisperse. CDSE is just the brightest, most beautiful material you can look at, but you can't eat it. So <laughs> um, unfortunately, it, it kind of seduced everybody into thinking, all right, why make TV screens out of the worst stuff that we've got? We should make it out of the best. And that's why we started out with CDSE. And unfortunately, got kind of stuck in that technology rut, only to find out later, it was, it was maybe 20, 2012, 2013, 2014, we started to see court cases and rules against cadmium uh, essentially eliminating CDSE as a possibility for the final emitter. Right, but the good news is then there's, there's life after chemistry, which is more chemistry, yeah. and, and now yeah. Jonathan's reinventing, if you like, the, the, going through the periodic table to find new materials that have the, the outstanding optical properties, but without the toxicity of cadmium. And uh, then we build the LEDs out of them and find out, at each stage we find out when we're going to fail. And if we get all the way through, usually where we fail is the lifetime. But if the lifetime is bad and the efficiency is OK, then maybe this is something the community can grasp onto. And so okay. that's what we kind of look for. Um, any more questions? Uh, Professor Lin? Yeah. OK, thank you. Nice talk, anyway. Uh, I'm thinking that the cadmium uh, selenide is just works so well, mm. probably is mainly related to the covalent interactions and then allow you to easier to manipulate. And according to the last page, you try to project the future study. Mm -hmm. You proxguide or other, uh, even uh, uh, copper chloride or some. The problem with those one were introduced ionic interactions inside. And we know that when ionic crystal, because probably will become bristle. Uh, Brittle, yeah. That means something like, uh, where even you can get uh, some sort of a narrow uh, or quantum dots, yeah. probably their stability were not as good as a cadmium. I'm not true. sure. I, so you're right, you're right. I it's comment actually, right or not. So yeah. I, I made the comparison between three fives being more covalent than the two sixes, but it's actually kind of the mix of ionic and covalent. It's at the right halfway point. And yeah, but uh, when you uh, when introduce you the ionic, ionic, you know that uh, yeah, it's yeah, become yeah. some sort of a structure, become very fractional, yes. and, and some sort of harder to, 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 to manipulate or those kind of things. Anyway. So the problem yeah. with the materials that become more ionic, particularly mm -hmm. the perovskites and the copper-based materials, they're very sensitive to water, right? They're much more soluble than uh, the cadmium selenide. Mm -hmm. um, cadmium selenide is, though, uh, sensitive on the surface. And again, you only need to build one or two trap sites to essentially deactivate a nanocrystal. And once you've done that, you've killed your emission efficiency. What's okay, nice about the perovskite, <laughs> sorry, what's nice about the perovskite and even some of the copper materials is because of their, um, particularly the copper materials have a different emission mechanism called self-trapping, by which they highly localized the excited state. And therefore, it's a, little, it's a lot more immune rather than the delocalized electron that you know, varies throughout the entire nanocrystal. Um, it's much more localized, so it emits much more strongly from that position and has more difficulty communicating with the outside traps. For the perovskites, they have this sort of, they are sensitive to water because they're a little more ionic, but they're also very, very bright, again, because of specifics of their um, emission, emission pathway. Uh, and so if they can be protected properly and essentially contained, they could be even brighter or as bright as CAD selenide. So you can already find um, preps that will give you 100% quantum yield with these uh, lead materials. We found 100% quantum yield with some of these copper-based materials as well. So although there are always all these challenges, again, protecting them from the environment, again, as you said, because they're a little too ionic, um, they can be solved through chemistry. So this is what we work on, which is what we're trying to do. Any other questions out there? Well, you made the long trek up to the IAS. Uh, I'm sure you want to uh, make some comment or question. I, I, while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to point out uh, many of these new copper compounds, uh, although they do look very ionic formulas, most of those, are, those compounds are copper 1+. Plus. And I have a question for you, John. So uh, the thing that's very notable in all of these materials, which is different from other areas, maybe of... Um, material science, uh, the complete lack of oxides. And uh, it, what's interesting, you say, oh, well, oxides are very wide band gap materials because the oxygen is really two minus, and these things have too large a band gap. 
But actually, it means things like copper one oxide, one plus oxide, i.e. Cu2O, uh, is actually a pretty conductive type of material. And there are a lot of oxide conductors. Is there any prospect of engineering those to, uh, to, to, sure. to emit in the, so, the right type uh, of optical wavelengths? I skipped wavelengths? over a lot of it, but um, the inorganic materials we identified early on as good electron hole conductors were nickel oxide and uh, zinc oxide and tin oxide. So we can make nanocrystals out of those, for sure. They don't tend to be used for emissive properties. And they don't, you're right, they don't seem to be studied as much by sort of the 2.6 quantum dot community. We have our, our little area. We don't wander too far outside of it. Um, I've seen sort of like oxyhalides of bismuth in the perovskite literature. You can make nanocrystals out of those. Um, they don't tend to emit particularly well. The problem generally with oxides is the oxygen is very hard to control the position. So you have a lot of variation in, and a lot, therefore a lot of trap sites from these sort of oxide materials. Selenides, sulfides, even sulfides are a little disordered. Selenides tend to be pretty well ordered. Um, so um, this tends to be where people have focused their effort. On the halides, the halides are just, uh, I think, very easy to make. <laughs> and therefore, um, uh, people have less, are less interested in using oxygen. Again, oxygen, lead have combinations that uh, just produce a trap site and don't really make what you'd like. But you're right, there is actually space for looking at wide band gap materials, uh, particularly for um, transparent conductive oxides, things like that. And people have worked in this area. I think it doesn't uh, stick to this field very much, but it's kind of around the edges, because we do use these materials as transport materials, and we do usually buy them from Sigma Aldrich, although uh, we used to make them. So zinc oxide, for example, is not hard to make. OK, thanks. Um, Last chance for anybody? Anyway, uh, Frederick, any? So if not, uh, let's thank John for a very uh, comprehensive overview and a very personal insight into how to make these quantum dots. And I think a very interesting cautionary tale that even when you're successful and have these wonderful applications, you're not out of the woods to, 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 to making lots of money. And maybe that's a, that's a good lesson for scientists to learn. <laughs> you better stick to, to the science and, and let the financial people handle the companies. Well, I'll, <laughs> point, I'll point out that somebody made a lot of money. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. A very entertaining okay. and, and very illuminating, sorry, no pun intended, uh, talk. All right. Thanks very much, John. OK. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the IIS directors as well. <laughs>